Lake Michigan Shipwreck by CSGO Pro. We often sought opportunities to bond and create lasting memories as a young family. So on that sunny Saturday morning, we loaded our car with picnic baskets, beach towels, and sunscreen and set off for a day trip to Lake Michigan. The anticipation filled the air as we drove along the winding roads, eager to immerse ourselves in the natural beauty that awaited us. Upon arrival, we were greeted by a breathtaking sight. The vast expanse of the lake stretched out before us, its sparkling waters dancing under the sun's golden rays. The rhythmic crashing of waves against the shore serenaded our senses, promising a day filled with joy and tranquility. We eagerly scouted the area for the perfect spot to settle down. After a short walk, we found a secluded cove nestled amidst a cluster of towering trees. The lush greenery provided a welcome respite from the summer heat, and the shade cast playful patterns on the ground below. With our little ones already racing toward the water, my spouse and I quickly set up our beach towels, creating a cozy, relaxing haven. The gentle breeze kissed our skin as we watched our children frolic in the shallow waters, their laughter echoing joyfully. As the hours slipped away, we explored further along the shoreline. Hand in hand, we strolled along the sandy beach, relishing the sensation of warm grains between our toes. Our footsteps left imprints that were quickly swallowed by the incoming tide as if erasing our presence from the world. I noticed something peculiar about the water's surface during our leisurely walk. Intrigued, I squinted my eyes and strained to get a better look. Just a few yards away, there was an object that defied explanation. Its shape was grotesque and unsettling, an amalgamation of twisted metal and decaying wood. The murky water lapped against its corroded surface as if eager to claim its sinister secret. The air grew heavy and there was like this sense of foreboding, as if the lake was whispering a warning. Driven by curiosity and a nagging sense of unease, I approached the object very cautiously. The closer I got, the more disturbing it became. Rust-covered chains dangling from the sides, their links clinking eerily in the breeze. A tattered flag fluttered weakly as its peak barely recognizable as a remnant of what it once was. As I inched closer, a foul stench assaulted my nostrils, causing me to gag. The putrid odor hung like a vile specter, a reminder of the darkness within. Trembling, I touched the object, my fingers hesitantly brushing against its cold, slimy surface. That's when I saw it, from the depths of the murky water, lifeless eyes staring back at me. They were hollow and empty, devoid of any spark of life. Panic gripped my heart as the realization set in. I had stumbled upon a long-forgotten shipwreck, its haunting presence resurfacing to claim its victims. The oppressive atmosphere grew suffocating as if the spirits of the shipwrecked souls were closing in around me. Shadows danced menacingly beneath the water's surface, their elongated forms hinting at unspeakable horrors lurking below. In a frenzy, I retreated from the dreadful scene, stumbling back onto the safety of the shore. The once inviting waters now seemed tainted, their serenity shattered by the specter of the shipwreck laughter of my children faded into the distance replaced by an unsettling silence that seemed to mock my terror. As I rejoined my family, I tried to shake off the chilling encounter, immersing myself again in the idyllic surroundings I was in, but the image of those lifeless eyes haunted my thoughts, casting a dark shadow over the remainder of our day at Lake Michigan. The once cheerful atmosphere now felt tinged with an unshakable sense of unease, the waves that had once appeared inviting now seemed to crash around the shore with an ominous rhythm, as if whispering secrets of the lake's dark history. I couldn't help but share my harrowing discovery with my spouse, their eyes widening with the concern and disbelief that I had also shared. We decided it was best not to alarm the children to preserve the innocence of their carefree day at the beach, but the weight of what I had continued to bear on us casting a pall over our family outing. 
we returned to our chosen spot by the cove to regain some sort of normalcy. The children resumed their play, building sand castles and splashing in the shallows, their laughter ringing out like fragile echoes against the vastness. But the horror I had witnessed lingered, its tendrils seeping into every crevice of my mind. The vibrant hues of the setting sun that once warmed the sky now appeared sinister, casting long foreboding shadows across the water. As dusk settled in, we gathered our belongings and prepared to leave. They had transformed into a canvas of deep purples and oranges, a stark contrast to the earlier brilliance of the day. Reluctantly, we turned our backs on the lake, bidding farewell to its secrets. The drive home was filled with an uneasy silence broken only by the occasional hum of the car engine. The weight of the shipwreck's discovery bore heavily upon our hearts as if it was now a piece of us, a piece of that dark history we had brought home with us, unwilling to let it go. Days turned into weeks and the memory of the haunting encounter still refused to fade. It invaded my dreams, a nightmarish loop that replayed the sight of those lifeless eyes, reminding me of the fragility of existence and the unseen terrors that lurked beneath the surface. In the following weeks I found myself researching Lake Michigan's history, delving into its past, the depths of the waters that I just so needed to know about. Tales of shipwrecks and lost souls filled the pages of forgotten archives, each story a testament to the lake's treacherous nature. It became clear that the shipwreck I had stumbled upon was just one of the many remnants of a bygone era when the waters of Lake Michigan were unforgiving, claiming both the brave and the foolhardy who dared to traverse its vastness. Though time passed and life resumed its normal rhythm, a part of me would forever be connected with that haunting encounter. Once a place of solace and tranquility, Lake Michigan now held a darker, more enigmatic allure. The memory of those lifeless eyes served as a chilling reminder that the beauty can conceal horrors beyond imagination, and that sometimes the terrifying things that we fear and read about in stories lie just beneath the surface, waiting to be discovered. A Cold Day in Louisiana by Anonymous Here is a story that occurred to me about four years ago. It was an abnormally cold day. Sure, it can get cold in the late parts of the year, but usually in Louisiana, it doesn't get that cold. Maybe around the high 50s, maybe 60s, but on that day, it was in the low 20s. The carbon dioxide was like a cigarette smoke that came from my mouth as I sighed. I had two layers of coats on, very heavy coats, plus a bunch of other stuff to keep me warm. It was a long day at school and I was ready to get out of there. The school is surrounded by somewhat dense forest. I always look in the tree line as I walk home from school, because I just feel like I'm not alone and I'm being watched. As school ended, I eagerly barked out of the gate and started walking home. My house is a good 30, maybe 40 minutes away. I walked down the same path through the woods as I always did, when suddenly I heard a scream or more like a screech that echoed in the forest. It has probably been 20 minutes since I began my walk through the woods, and it's already getting dark. I then begin to smell the stench of something rotten. That is when I almost trip on something. I looked down and almost puked. There, in front of me, were the horrifically mangled remains of a man who had gone missing a few days prior. I froze and moved only my eyes spastically left to right. Nothing. Suddenly, the, the, the same screech echoed in the woods, but this time closer than before. I froze again. Then I heard the spine-chilling crunch of leaves and sticks not too far away from where I was. Then, from out of nowhere, the temperature suddenly spiked. It went from freezing to what felt like summer weather, meaning that it gets to almost 110 degrees out of nowhere. By now, I was scared out of my mind. I started fast walking when something felt like it was watching me. I swerved around, and with the dying light, I saw it. It was fast. 
so fast that I only caught the sheer size of whatever it was. It was at least eight feet tall. I screamed unintentionally and ran. Then, I tripped on the roots of a tree that were probably three-fourths of the way through the forest, which ended up absolutely murdering my right leg. Then, I saw those eyes. It was pitch black and the temperature was so dang hot. But, I know what I was looking at. It was a set of eyes, at least 15 feet away just staring at me. They were glowing yellow with jet black viper pupils. I slowly reached in my back pocket, not leaving the vision of those eyes. My fingers met my phone and I pulled it out gingerly. I turned the flashlight on and I still have nightmares about it to this day. In the few seconds I had, I screamed the absolute crap out of my lungs at that sight. The beast was dark crimson in color, almost like blood. Its sternum protruded from its chest with a point. It had long, black hair with two curved crimson horns. It had two pairs of blood red wings. The upper ones were massive while the lower ones were shorter and thinner. A long crimson tail flicked in the air as well. Instead of fingers, it had what I can describe more like clawed talons. But what the most horrifying thing about this creature was, was its unholy grin. That darn grin was stretching to its ears and its teeth were huge. It, uh, like, th these teeth, if I had to guess, were at least an, a foot long or so. They were like kitchen knives. Before I could even take a picture, it ran off with such speed that it pulled air away. And I started limping away, not noticing that the bone in my leg was literally protruding through my skin. Then I fell, looked up, and there it was. It grabbed me and hoisted me in the air. It had me face to face. It snorted in my face. It reeked of decay. It was the most disgusting thing I think I've ever smelled in my life. I was 13 at the time, and I was a major wuss, some would say. I cried. I sobbed, and my face went to tears. It is at that point the creature, maybe feeling sympathetic, cocked its head and put a finger to my mouth. It was burning hot and felt like stone. Then, everything went black. When I came to, I was at my front door, confused. I looked around and saw very clearly the same glowing eyes at me from bushes in the garden. But as soon as I saw them, they vanished. I then looked down at my leg to see that it was back to normal. But I turned my leg over to see something, or someone carved a huge symbol into my knee. I don't know what it was I saw, but I started writing short stories about it ever since. The Shack at the Lake by Kirby Hill I had always been drawn to the solitude of nature, finding solace in the untouched beauty that lay beyond the concrete jungle. So when the opportunity arose to take a nice little solo hiking trip along the shores of Lake Michigan, I eagerly packed my backpack, ready for an adventure that would free my soul. As I arrived at the trailhead, the morning sun spilled its golden rays across the vast expanse of the lake. The air was crisp and refreshing carrying with it that faint scent of pine trees as I set on the foot trail. A sense of excitement mingled with the tranquility of the surroundings, the path stretched out before me, winding through the dense forest promising hidden treasures at every turn. For hours I immersed myself in natural wonders that surrounded me. The towering trees formed a majestic canopy overhead, casting intriguing shadows on the ground below. The forest floor was carpeted with fallen leaves, their vibrant hues dejecting autumn's arrival. The gentle rustling of the foliage beneath my boots was the only sound apart from the occasional chirping of birds. As the day wore on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. It was a subtle sensation, like a whisper in the wind, but it sent shivers down my spine nonetheless. I paused scanning my surroundings, looking for any sign of movement or life, yet the forest remained eerily still, as if holding its breath. 
Convinced it was my imagination playing tricks on me, I pressed on, determined to reach my destination before nightfall. But as evening descended, a strange noise pierced the stillness. It was distant, faint, yet undeniably unnatural. It sounded like a muffled whimper, as if someone or something was in distress. My curiosity, it peaked. I veered off trail, following the sound more profoundly into the woods. With every step, the noise grew louder, yet it didn't seem to grow any closer. It echoed through the trees, bouncing off their trunks and branches, making it impossible to discern its origin. Branches snapped underfoot as I forged ahead, my heart pounding in my chest, a mix of fear and anticipation coursing through my veins. Suddenly, the noise ceased, leaving me standing in an eerie silence. I strained my ears, hoping to catch any trace of its return, and then behind a cluster of trees I saw a flicker of movement. I quickened my pace, drawn toward the source of the mysterious sound. As I rounded the last tree, my breath caught in my throat. Before me stood a dilapidated shack, its wooden planks weathered and worn by time. The air surrounding it seemed heavy, as if carrying the weight of forgotten secrets. The whimpering sound emanated from within, growing louder and just more disturbing with every passing moment. Summoning all of my courage, I pushed open the creaking door, revealing a scene that would forever haunt my dreams. The shack's interior was shrouded in darkness, save for a single ray of light streaming through a cracked window, illuminating a ghastly sight. Lining the walls were rows upon rows of cages, each holding a different creature, a macabre menagerie of twisted nightmares. Some had feral eyes and sharp teeth, and their bodies contorted in unnatural shapes. Others were skeletal and emaciated, their skin clinging desperately to their frames. The stench of decay hung heavy in the air, mingling with the pitiful cries that echoed through the room. Terror gripped me as I realized the true horror of the situation. These creatures, trapped and tormented, were the source of the haunting sounds that I had heard throughout my hike. Someone had inflicted unspeakable, un undeniable cruelty on these, these absolute terrified creatures subjecting them to unimaginable suffering. I could feel their pain resonating into the depths of my soul, compelling me to take action. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my phone and dialed the emergency services. As I relayed the details of the horrific discovery, my voice quivered with fear and determination. The operator assured me that help was coming, urging me to stay put until the authorities arrived. I obeyed, unable to tear away from the pitiful creatures trapped within the cages. Once filled with despair, their eyes now seemed to hold a glimmer of hope as they sensed salvation drawing near. Time waiting there seemed to stretch agonizingly long as I waited for the sound of approaching sirens, yearning for this nightmare to end. Finally, the distant wail of emergency vehicles reached my ears, slicing through the heavy silence. Relief flooded my being but I couldn't help but feel haunted by the atrocities I had witnessed. I knew that even as the captives were set free, the scars of their torment would forever mar their existence. The rescue operation unfolded with precision and urgency. Along with animal welfare organizations, law enforcement officers arrived to dismantle the grotesque menagerie and provided medical attention to the surviving creatures. Their dedication and compassion in the face of such darkness rekindled a flicker of faith within me. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting an ethereal glow over the scene, I slowly returned to the trail. Once serene and comforting, the air now carried a weight of sorrow. The forest, not so inviting anymore, not like it used to be. I walked with heavy footsteps, burdened by the knowledge that evil could lurk in even the most picturesque corners of the world. The beauty I had once admired now felt tainted, tarnished by the grotesque acts that I had witnessed. The shadows stretched before me, their elongated forms dancing in the fading light, reminding me of the darkness that could consume the purest of intentions. That solo hiking trip that began with a thirst for solitude had transformed into a journey of enlightenment and purpose. Though scarred by the horrors I had witnessed, I emerged with a newfound determination to be the voice for the voiceless the echoes of that haunting whimper that would forever reverberate in my heart.
a constant reminder of the dark that lurks in the world and the unwavering need to bring light to its darkest corners. Lake Huron Spookiness by Anonymous I grew up in the state of Michigan, in a town called Port Austin, right on the great lake of Lake Huron. It's a small town with not much to do besides peruse the small mom and pop shops or go to the diner in the center of town and check out some cool classic cars at the show that is held once a week. Whenever I could, I chose to escape the mundanity and go to my father's cabin in the neighboring city of Grindstone. It was a small community town with nothing but woods and farmland and a nice area for hunting and fishing, once again on the shores of Lake Huron. At the time, I was 14 years old and I went up for the weekend with my older brother, a marine straight out of Iraq, returning home that same weekend from a short hunting trip. My brother was tough as nails, and he wasn't afraid of anything, but that day I would see a side of him I wouldn't soon forget. We took the ATV and headed out to a cornfield with an abandoned farmhouse. To set the scene, we were hunting pheasant in the cornfield that opens up to a clearing, and beyond that is the beautiful Lake Huron. We entered the opposite side, which is smaller, lighter woodsy area, but has a trail where we park the ATV that leads out to the cornfield. We headed out fairly late sometime around 4 p.m. after fishing earlier that day, and hadn't had that much luck, so we were deciding to head back at around 7 p.m. As we were exploring the abandoned farmhouse, my brother sat down for a cigarette and called me over to the front to check something out. His face was pale, and he choked on his words. He told me to look over there and pointed. I saw a huge wolf about 300 yards in the clearing ahead of me, standing on its hind legs. This thing was massive and covered in thick black fur. I couldn't really see how tall it actually was from the distance, but its legs looked huge and this thing was muscular with an oddly shaped torso and long slender hind legs. My brother told me to grab one of the shotguns. When it heard him, it turned and looked exactly at us, seeming to be leering slightly. It then took a few strides on its hind legs then went down on all fours and darted into the cornfield in the direction of our ATV. It was starting to get dark now. The sky was red, purple, and orange. We decided to enter the cornfield from the farthest end that this wolf went into. I was on flashlight duty, so I could see all of our surroundings. While he walked ahead of me with a shotgun the entire time, I felt like I was being watched and I swear I heard nearby rustling and low growls and snarls when we would stop. Eventually, what was a 10 minute walk seemed to take an hour. We made it to the trail where the ATV was parked. I started to calm down now that I could see my surroundings better, and that's when I heard the iconic horror movie cliche of a branch or twig snapping, followed by rustling in the cornfield behind us. I shined the flashlight on a patch of stalks where I thought I heard the movement, and sure enough, I saw a pair of yellow reflective eyes about six feet high through a crack in the corn stalks. My brother yelled at it to F off, then it let out an eerie howl that sounded like it was right in my ear. My brother fired one shot, hitting the top of the corn stalks, and then told me to hightail it to the ATV and get it started. I started it, and when I felt him jump on the back after me, I punched a throttle and floored it across to the access road and then onto the main road that cuts through the town. I looked behind me once or twice and saw a huge black mass dart across the road quickly from out of the cornfield into the darkness of the woods. We headed back to our house in town that night and didn't return until about 12 p.m. the next day to collect our things from the cabin, still unnerved. I had always heard the rumors of the Michigan Dog Man, but I always thought it was just an old wives' tale, like the boogeyman that my dad told me to scare me straight as a kid. I thought it was just some state urban legend like the Skunk Ape of Florida or Chupacabra, etc. To this day, my brother and I talk about it over some beers, but it was definitely a scary experience for the both of us. I even still go hunting in those parts to this day, but haven't seen anything since, and I hope that I don't see it again.
A Night I Can't Forget by Anonymous. When I was about 16 years old, I got a job as a personal assistant slash cleaning lady for a wealthy couple living in a big, beautiful mansion on Lake Michigan. It was a great job then, but after a while, I had to quit because of everything going on, and I'll tell you exactly what that was. I made $12 an hour as a 16-year-old girl, which was just crazy to me at the time. But now I know it's because the homeowners couldn't get anyone to stay to work for them. But I didn't see them all that much during the school year, so it was fine. I would work 40 hours a week in the summer and part-time while in school. So during the school year, I would hardly ever see the homeowners and would be left alone to clean the house. I had a key, alarm, and gate code, so I let myself in and out as I pleased essentially. In the summer months, I had help from a few other employees, but in the school year, it was just me. At first, I loved being in the house alone. Don't get me wrong. The place was gorgeous right on Lake Michigan, had a beautiful view of it. I'd always open all the curtains to let the sun shine in and blast the surrounding sound speakers while I cleaned. It wasn't until I was alone that I started noticing how weird the place was. Nothing ever felt welcoming about the place. Sure, it was pretty to look at, but it was modern and everything was marble and stone. Not a very homey feeling. My first experience happened when I was cleaning one day in silence. I remember not turning on the music because I had a bad headache that day. Suddenly, the speaker to the upstairs part of the house turned on. The way their speaker system works, you can control it by a touchpad in the kitchen, which would play music everywhere besides the basement and main bedroom. To play music in those areas, you must go to the touchpad, turn it on by the control pad, and sync it up with the rest of the house. The reason this was so alarming was because I was the only one there. I walked up the stairs to check what was going on and figure out why the music turned on, seemingly by itself. I looked around and called the homeowner's name, thinking someone had just come in without me noticing, but the doors were still locked and no one was home. I shut off the music and went back downstairs not thinking too much of it. It started happening more often though. I'd be listening to music and it would turn off, or it would be off and turn on in a completely different area of the house. I brushed it off as faulty electronics and didn't really think much of it. The second most prevalent story I remember from working there was when I was cleaning the workout room in their basement. I never wanted to go into this room, and I couldn't tell you why. Something about this room just felt weird. It was super cold and dark and I felt anxious in that room no matter what time of day. I tried to avoid it at all cost, but my boss would get mad when the dust would build up so I forced myself to go down there once a week to tidy up. So anyway, I was in the workout room using a broom and mop. I remember sweeping the floor and propping the door open against the machine while I used the mop. Suddenly, the broom fell over, hitting the wall, and the baseboard to the floor as it was fell, causing three distinct knocks. What I heard after scared me so badly I refused to go into that room by myself ever again. Immediately following the knocks made by the broom falling, three knocks responded in the exact pattern the broom fell, but it was coming from inside the wall. I know what you're thinking. It was not an echo. It was not some sort of scared animal. It was knocking. Deliberate knocking. I was utterly alone in a big, quiet house in the middle of nowhere on Lake Michigan, and someone was knocking back at me from inside the wall. To this day, I have no explanation for what I experienced. Lastly, this was the first and only time I've ever seen anything paranormal with my two eyes. And I know this time it's not me being paranoid or crazy because I was with a coworker who saw it too. Sometimes my boss would rent out her guest house and we would clean it before the guest would arrive. So this guest house has a big glass hallway leading from one main area of the house to another. I was cleaning the house while one of my coworkers, Bob, was standing next to me. Just then, I catch a glimpse of what looked like a boy in a blue shirt running by. I turned my head just as Bob turned his head as well. He asked me if I saw that too, and I said yes. Thank you for sharing my stories. Hopefully everybody enjoyed them. The Darkest Part of the Woods by Ian F. 
Usually I listen to YouTuber horror stories just before camping to get good ones to scare my friends. I usually laugh at how dumb sounding some of them are and thought they were all made up until one happened to me. My nine friends and three adults were camping near Flaming Gorge in Utah. We stayed for three nights. Our teenagers ranged from 14 to 18, so being teenagers, we told scary stories until about 1 a.m. every single night. We told stories like the Black Eyed Children, the Whistling Man, and the Helper. Everything was normal, and it was all pretty much fun until the last night. We had been joking about not looking at the darkest part of the woods because your mind would play tricks on you. The adults were at a separate camp a few hundred yards away and couldn't really hear us. We had three tents and in the middle of a scary part of one of the stories about disappearing people, our tent shook hard. We all perked up and stared at each other. I and two others walked to check it out. No one was outside or inside. Only one other party was camping far down the road. They were a few older people and we didn't think they would bug us. We looked around again and there was no one there, but a rock about the size of my fist lay there. I was shook. Someone had thrown a rock at our tent to scare us, that's for sure. We thought maybe it was the adults, but they were in the opposite direction. We just shook it off. Things like this happened again and again, and that's when we really started to get worried. There were two 18-year-olds with us, Max and Caden, who weren't the type to get easily scared, that's for sure. Max was huge and robust, and Caden loved horror movies, so he didn't get scared easily. We knew it wasn't good when they were freaked out. We were all jumpy and, I guess at this point, pretty loud because the adults came and told us to quiet down. We told them what happened, and they all began to laugh thinking we were joking and left us behind once more. It was almost midnight when we decided to go quiet down a little bit more and try to listen to the person doing this to us so we could talk or yell at them. We finally heard a loud snap as we saw a massive branch break from very high up in a tree. We screamed and shined our lights the way we heard it. We saw the snapped branch and nothing else though. We then saw a rock explode in the fire. Luckily it was small and didn't hurt anyone, but it scared us bad enough that we jumped in my six person tent. Ten of us. It wasn't too pleasant. We finally went out and immediately regretted it. We went back to the fire and stoked it. We figured by now it was a person and we weren't really scared but more pissed off. We never could catch them with the light, which terrified us all. Nothing happened for quite a few minutes, so we figured maybe they had stopped for the night. Then, we heard something. We decided we would all need to work together to find this person. We went into the forest. We were all terrified. What happened next has messed up camping for us for the longest time. We had an uneasy feeling, and that's when we heard it. A raspy, eerie whistle. We all screamed and ran to the tent. We heard it nonstop. That's the other thing that makes us think it couldn't be human. There were no breaks in the whistling to catch a breath, just the creepy whistle for about 15 minutes straight. We ran back to our tent, like I said, and we hid in there and never went out for the rest of the night. I know this ending is pretty anticlimactic, but that's our story, and it still makes camping weird for us to this day. Wexford County Dogman by Allotted Flea Let me preface this by saying this as an accurate account of what I went through five years ago. I lived in northern Michigan near Wexford County when this occurred. I've always been fascinated by urban legends and tales of supernatural creatures. I've heard of the Dogman since I was young and I first heard the legend played on the radio many moons ago. A mysterious creature said to roam the forest of the Great Lakes region. And with my fascination came a sense of wanting to find the animal and to see it for myself if it was truly out there. Armed with a curious mind and a flashlight, I would explore the woods near my hometown. It was an overcast night, with only the dim glow of the stars to really guide my path. As I ventured deeper into the forest, I couldn't shake off that feeling of being watched by something. Every rustle of the leaves and snap of a twig sent shivers down my spine. 
but I pressed on, my curiosity overpowering my unease. Little did I know how much of a mistake it was to ignore my instincts. After what felt like hours of wandering, I stumbled forward. An eerie silence blanketed the forest as if a switch was flipped, and all the sounds in the world seemingly disappeared. Something drew me toward it, an invisible force urging me to step closer. That's when I surveyed my surroundings in detail and saw it. A pair of glowing amber eyes staring at me from the shadows. My heart skipped a beat as the creature revealed itself. A massive canine-like figure standing up on two legs. Its fur was matted and dark. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. It, it was a dogman, no doubt. And it had fixed its gaze upon me. A primal fear surged through my veins and I stumbled back, dropping my flashlight in the process. And with but a moment's hesitation, I turned and ran as fast as my legs would carry me. Heavy footsteps pounded behind me, growing louder and closer with each passing second. I could hear its snarls and the sharp snapping of its jaws, hungry for the chase. My breath grew ragged and my muscles screamed in protest, but the adrenaline fueled my desperate sprint. Branches whipped against my face and the forest seemed to rise up to trip me, but I passed through, determined to escape the clutches of the monstrous dogman. My lungs burned and my vision blurred as I reached the edge of the woods. My house stood just a few yards away, its light providing a beacon of hope. Summoning my last strength reserves, I sprinted across the yard and flung open the front door. I slammed it shut, panting heavily as I leaned up against it, my heart racing, pounding in my chest, feeling like it would explode at any second. I felt relief and terror as I looked through the window and saw the dogman standing at the edge of the clearing, its gaze still fixed upon me. Its mouth curled up into a wicked snarl, revealing sharp, glistening teeth and what looked like a cruel and deranged smile. For just a moment, we locked eyes, a battle of wills between human and beast. I knew I had escaped, but the encounter had left an indelible mark on my soul. The dogman had shown me the darkness lurking just beyond the realm of our understanding, and it was a sight I would never forget. To this day, I am plagued by the memory of that night. The image of the dogman's glowing eyes and sinister grin haunts my dreams. A constant reminder of the terrors in the shadows. I warn anyone who dares to venture into the Michigan wilderness, beware the dogman's domain. It may be an urban legend to some, but it's all too real for those who have encountered its hostility. The forest hides its secret well, and the dogman waits patiently for its next victim. Since then, I haven't been able to look at the woods without a shudder going down my spine, hoping that I don't see those amber eyes staring back at me. If I were to give you all any advice at all, it would be to do not go out into the woods at night. Backwoods Virginia is no joke by Jackson T. The crisp autumn air tickled my face as I ventured deeper into the vast wilderness of the backwoods in Virginia. I had always found solace in the solitude of nature, but this solo hiking trip was my escape from the chaos of the city. Little did I know that this journey would turn sinister, plunging me into a nightmarish world I could have never imagined. As I trekked along the narrow, winding trail, a sense of unease settled over me. It started as a subtle tingling in the back of my neck, a fleeting whisper of a presence lurking just beyond my line of sight. I shrugged it off as my mind playing tricks on me, dismissing it as a byproduct of the eerie atmosphere of the forest. But the feeling it persisted, growing stronger with each passing step. Seeing eyes were watching my every move, studying my vulnerability, a shiver racing down my spine and I couldn't shake the creeping sensation that I was being stalked. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding, and glanced around expecting to glimpse my pursuer. However, the forest remained eerily still, not a single leaf rustling and no sign of movement. I reasoned that it must have been my overactive imagination fueled by my stories that I have heard a million times on the internet. I had also heard local folklore about these woods, but I figured these were mere figments of my subconscious. 
Determined to shake off my unfounded fears, I continued my hike, quickening my pace and the distance between myself and whatever oppressive presence was following me. But the relentless feeling of being hunted clung to me like a suffocating shadow. With each passing minute, I intensified. This drove me to the edge of paranoia. I decided to take a break and gather my composure. I found a fallen log near a trickling stream and sat down, trying to catch my breath any way I could. The forest silence weighed heavily upon me, broken only by the faint rustling of leaves and the distant hoot of an owl. I scanned the surroundings, my eyes darting from tree to tree expecting to see the lurking figure, but nothing ever revealed itself. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye a fleeting shadow darting between the trees. My heart skipped a beat as I leapt to my feet, adrenaline surging through my veins. I called out, my voice trembling. Is someone there? Silence greeted my words, mocking my unease. I convinced myself that it was just a woodland creature scurrying away. Nothing more, nothing less. Yet my trepidation, it persisted, urging me to investigate further. With a deep breath, I ventured off the trail, pushing through the underbrush towards where I had seen the shadowy figure. The forest grew denser, its embrace growing tighter as if it was a warning for me to turn back. But for some weird reason, almost like I was possessed, I pressed on, my curiosity fueled by the fear and determination I felt. Minutes turned into hours as I trudged more profoundly into the wilderness. The foliage grew thicker, casting elongated shadows that danced around me. The oppressive silence was broken only by the rhythmic thump of my heartbeat. My senses were on high alert, every rustle of the leaves and distant crack of branches echoing like an alarm in my mind. Then, as if emerging from a twisted nightmare, I stumbled upon a clearing, a macabre tableau frozen in time. The ground was littered with decaying carcasses, the rotting flesh picked clean by scavengers. The stench of death filled the air, suffocating and repulsive. My stomach churned, threatening to unleash its contents. I cast in horror, recoiling as I recognized and realized the gruesome truth. These were not remains of animals. They were human. A wave of nausea crashed over me, and bile rose in my throat. The magnitude of the horror before me was incomprehensible. How could this be? How, who could have done such a thing? A noise behind me shattered the silence, wrenching me from my shock-induced stupor. I spun around, my heart pounding in my ears, only to come face to face with the source of my terror. It stood there, towering over me, a monstrous figure covered in tattered rags, its grotesque face hidden beneath a mask of stitched-together flesh. Fear paralyzed my every muscle as I found myself trapped in its gaze. It had lifeless eyes. Its mouth was opened, emitting an otherworldly hiss that seemed to penetrate my very soul. My mind reeled, unable to comprehend the nightmarish entity before me. With an unholy speed, the creature lunged towards me, its jagged claws reaching out to tear me apart. At that moment, pure instinct took over and I sprinted away, my legs pumping with desperate adrenaline. The forest became a blur of shapes and colors as I raced through the undergrowth, desperate to escape the clutches of this abomination. My heart pounded in my chest, my breath coming in ragged gasp as I sprinted back toward the trail. The creature's blood-curdling screams echoed behind me, growing more distant with every step. I dared not to stop, I dared not to look back, afraid its horrifying visage would haunt my dreams forever. Finally, I burst out onto the trail, gasping for air, my body drenched in sweat. I stumbled forward, propelled by sheer willpower, until I reached the safety of my car. With trembling hands, I fumbled for the keys, slammed the door shut, locking myself in with the sanctuary of the vehicle. I peered through the windshield, scanning the tree line, half expecting the creature to emerge from the shadows at any given moment, but it remained hidden within the forest depths, its malice lurking in the darkness. As I drove away, my mind was a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. I knew the horrors I had witnessed would forever haunt me. 
Virginia's backwoods held ancient and evil secrets that were better left undisturbed. And as long as that creature roamed freely, I could never be sure it wouldn't find me again, lurking in the shadows, waiting to claim its next victim. The Michigan Boonies by Anonymous This story takes place in the boonies of Allenson, Michigan, about two years ago. I was over at my best friend Marcus's house. His house, for reference, is like a large barn-like structure with a basement. It was about the second week into the summer, and we were up for a snack run, like we normally do when it gets late, and we don't like to wake his grandparents. I don't get scared very easy, and I've always had unnaturally great hearing. So... I could tell when someone was moving around even in the dark with my eyes closed, and know where they were, and a rough idea of how tall they were, and how far they would be. I was pretty great for hide and seek. My friend Marcus and our other friends soon began to realize that I was pretty hard to play against. It was around 2 or 3 a.m. We were wide awake and bored. We decided to start a small campfire in the backyard next to their camper, about 300 yards away from the house and surrounding Marcus's grandparents' house is nothing but woods. We sit down and talk for a while, and then our friend Jay wanted to go into the camper for a while because he gets cold easy, and there are blankets in there. We decided that we would go in with him because he didn't want to be left alone. I was watching the fire because it always calms me down. I decided to stay out by the fire for a little longer. I started to realize that there were no crickets or bullfrogs making any noise, so I glanced around with my back to the camper and I didn't see anything. At least, not at first, so I didn't think anything of it. I start hearing more footsteps though coming from the edge of the woods. I looked up to see this dog-like creature on the edge of the woods, just behind the tree line. Its head was easily five to six feet from the ground with yellowish green eyes that seemed to glow. I didn't think anything of it, because animals are curious, just like we humans are. But I kept an eye on it. But not three minutes later, Marcus comes out of the camper and locked eyes with something to the left. There were two shadowy-like figures walking back and forth in the field, getting closer and closer. He sits down beside me while watching the figures and asked me if I saw them too. I told him I did and described exactly what I was seeing. I told him it felt like they were about 200 feet away and low to the ground. I pointed out the creature I was staring down in the tree line as well and told him to keep an eye out if they got closer and if they did, go inside the camper and not to come out unless I said otherwise. But thankfully, it didn't come to that. Morning broke and we were all pretty tired, but then I checked later in the day where the creature stood to see if there were any footprints or anything. I did notice that the grass was matted down but I didn't notice any distinct footmarks. I didn't tell Marcus or Jay that, because I wanted to keep them out of that stuff, and because once you've had an encounter with one, you're bound to have another one or so. Thank you for sharing my story. I'd appreciate it a lot if I could get any sort of ideas of what it may be. I've been watching your channel for a few years now, and I love the encounters everyone has shared. I think what I saw that night might be a dogman but I'm not sure. Concert Creeper by Anonymous So I was in 7th grade and really into music and going to concerts. My dad told me we could see Bad Finger and War at a free show in Toledo, Ohio. As far as I know, they have this concert every year. It's called Party in the Park and takes place at this lovely park right on the banks of Lake Erie. I was a little hippie who wore rose-colored glasses. My favorite band was the Beatles, so of course I was ecstatic to see a band that had been signed to Apple Records and I was also psyched to see War as I love Lowrider and Spill the Wine. If I recall correctly, Bad Finger was playing one day and then a day or two later War played. I think I also had the opportunity to see Blue Oyster Cult, but I passed. So anyway, I went to Badfinger, 
I got my picture taken and an autograph from Joey Molland. So I was in my 60s music nerd heaven. My dad kept wandering off to get food or beer or speak to people he knew in the crowd. My mom probably would have flipped out if she'd known that my dad was leaving little teen me unattended at a free concert in Toledo, especially on the banks of Lake Erie. A lot of crazy stuff happens here, but I didn't mind a bit because I was feeling like a grown-up and independent. After all, I'd just met an absolute rock star, so obviously, I was okay, and nothing terrible would ever happen the same day something so extraordinary happened, right? It got dark very quickly after the concert, and I really wanted to go home, but my dad kept running into people he knew and chatting with them. He bumped into some guy, and the guy tried to show him his new boat, parked or docked or whatever, right there within sight of the stage at this concert. I was pumped to get on this boat and hang out. Still, there were all these super hot older men, by which I mean two guys who were probably 17 with slightly above average looks, on board. I was shy and clumsy, and I worried I would struggle to get onto the boat without falling over. So I said I'd hang out with inside of the ship and people watch, and my dad was like, cool, whatever, let me on that boat. I was standing there probably cheesing, pondering just how fantastic my day had been when this guy walked up to me and kind of punctured my happy little cloud. He was almost seven feet tall, solid, and a little chubby. He looked to be in his late 30s or early 40s and gave me the creeps. I also didn't like him because he looked very much like Mark David Chapman, and as previously stated, I was all about the Beatles at the time. Stephen King met and signed an autograph for Mark David Chapman not too long before MDC shot John Lennon. Stephen King described him as, the lights are on, nobody's home, the house is haunted. This guy had that look going for him. At this point in my life, I'd never really been approached by strangers, and I just spoke to him like I would have spoken to anybody else. He asked me about the concert, and I happily chattered away. Then asked where I was from, who was with me, I pointed out my dad, and then he asked me if I had a boyfriend. At 13 years old, I didn't know yet whether to answer this creepy guy's questions or really much about dating. But when somebody asked me if I had a boyfriend at the time, my answer was always going to be no, obviously. I told him that I didn't have one, and I didn't really want one, you know, I was 13. He started telling me how beautiful I was out of nowhere, and how my face was beautiful, how my body was beautiful, and how I seemed so much more grown up than 13, and all the while, he was looking at me in a way that made me feel like I was going to throw up. I have never been looked at like that by anybody and never really since. It wasn't one of those looks where like, oh, I'm infatuated with you. It was one of those looks that, ooh, you're my prey. And of course it would have to happen from a gigantic man that could easily overpower me and do whatever he wanted. He started reaching toward me and I kept taking steps back while talking to him because I was raised to not be rude. I was so afraid and so disgusted by how this man was looking at me that I was nearly in tears. Then, out of nowhere, my dad came running up and said he had been looking for me, and we had to leave right away. This guy ran away. I mean, sprinted. He was clearly not up to anything good. I saw his eyes when my dad ran up, and he looked genuinely afraid, like a deer caught in the headlights. My dad is useless about talking about anything complicated. He had a rough childhood that he never really talks about, so he just started chatting all sunshiny about where we were going to eat. I tried to shake off what had just happened and felt so bad. But, when we got to the restaurant, I had to go off to the ladies' room and cry. I was too innocent even to be afraid that I might have been kidnapped, murdered, or something else. What was messing with my head the most, though, was how he looked at me. I was so pumped about puberty, which I'd already hit. But, the thought of having breasts and all that stuff was fantastic, having hips was excellent. I couldn't, you know, really wait to be an adult. But now... For the first time, I'd experienced a feeling of having a female body is almost like a liability. I blamed myself for a while. I felt something about me must be wrong to have made an adult man act like that with me. I know all of that is BS though, but it was a rotten time for me and it took me a long time to get over it and understand and learn and grow. My dad and I never talked about that ever again. I never told my mom or stepdad either. I pushed it out of my mind and didn't even think about it for a long time afterward. I'm just grateful my dad came and scared that guy off when he did, and that he had the decency not to kick that guy's ass right then and there, because I would have been mortified to death, which would have been even worse. 
Because my dad had a light and a cheery demeanor afterward, I could pretend what had just happened wasn't as dangerous as it was. Tillamook Forest Murder In the haunting depths of the Tillamook State Forest, a sinister murder unfolded, shrouding the tranquil woods in darkness. Brace yourself as we delve into the chilling details of this true crime tale. Warning, the story you're going to hear has some disturbing details. Viewer discretion is advised. It was a cold December morning when a Tillamook County Sheriff's Office deputy ventured into the forest, seeking to engage with long-term campers at a designated campsite, campsite number three to be exact. Little did they know, they were about to stumble upon a horrific scene. Amidst the towering trees, the deputy discovered the lifeless body of a 52-year-old man. His winter-clad figure lay motionless on the ground, blood staining his face head and neck, a silver-colored Hyundai Santa Fe bearing an Oregon license plate loomed nearby, a silent witness to the heinous act. The signs of violence were unmistakable. The area surrounding the victim's body was littered with empty 38 special shell casings, a grim testament to a deadly encounter. But it didn't end there. The perpetrator, or perpetrators, had left no stone unturned. The victim's pockets had been rifled, his wallet and identification vanished. To add to the new mystery, the victim's trusty blue Toyota minivan was nowhere to be found. As the puzzle pieces began to fall into place, the gaze turned towards two women residing at campsite number three. They lived in the same Hyundai Santa Fe that stood as a macabre centerpiece to the crime scene. The deputy's prior encounters with the women added an eerie layer to the investigation. Their car had experienced mechanical issues, and they refused when offered assistance that required separation. These encounters now took on a new significance. The abandoned Hyundai Santa Fe offered crucial clues. Personal belongings, belonging to Lisa Peasley, one of the women, were found inside. A stockpile of unspent 38 special ammunition in a bag nearby mirrored the shells discovered earlier. The breakthrough came when investigators unearthed the murder weapon concealed beneath the leaves, debris, and a small wagon. A firearm bearing one spent casing and one unspent casing matching the evidence found at the crime scene and inside the car was now in their possession. The focus shifted to bringing Alyssa Zippera Sturgill and Lisa Marie Peasley to justice. Days later, in Hawthorne, Nevada, their stolen minivan was intercepted by law enforcement. Sturgill and Peasley were apprehended and caught red-handed in possession of the victim's stolen car. Initially charged with possessing a stolen vehicle, they exercised their right to remain silent, casting a chilling shadow over their true intentions. The Tillamook County Sheriff's Office spared no effort. Their detectives embarked on a journey to Nevada, armed with arrest warrants for murder, ready to commence an extradition process. The wheels of justice were set in motion. As we unravel this tragic tale, let us remember the victims whose life was abruptly vanquished. May our thoughts, sympathies, prayers, whatever it may be, accompany his grieving family and loved ones during their difficult time. This is just a glimpse into the Tillamook State Forest murder case, a stark reminder that evil can rear its nasty head even amidst serene landscapes. Stay vigilant and stay safe, for danger may lurk where you least expect it. If you want to know more about this, you can look up more about Sturgill and Peasley's court proceedings and journey online. There are many articles that have followed that. Ocala National Forest Murder Mystery In the heart of Florida's National Forest lies a mysterious case that has confounded investigators for decades. On October 2nd, 1966, two young women, Nancy Leitchner and Pam Nader, 
embarked on a seemingly innocent picnic adventure with the Aquaholic skin diving team. Little did they know, this would be their last known outing. Leichner and Nader joined the outing alongside Leichner's fiance and Nader's date, hoping for a day filled with laughter and outdoor enjoyment. The group gathered at the Alexander Springs Recreation Area in Altoona, Florida, between 2 and 3 p.m. They arrived ready to savor the beauty of nature. However, fate had something far more sinister for these unsuspecting women. As the day progressed, Leichner and Nader ventured into the nearby woods following one of the nature trails. It was an excursion that would forever alter the course of their lives. Strangely, they left their purses, clothing, shoes, and even Leichner's eyeglasses on a picnic table. There were no indications of their intentions or hint of the danger ahead. When the women failed to return, a search covered an expanse of 15 square miles, yet, despite the dedicated efforts and search teams, no trace of Leichner or Nader was ever found. Experts quickly ruled out the possibility of drowning in the swampy area. Both women were skilled swimmers and had no plans to dip on that chilly day. The investigation took a perplexing turn and suspicion turned towards a notorious figure, Gerard John Schaefer Jr., a serial killer believed to be responsible for the deaths of numerous young women in Florida. Schaefer's dark legacy had already left a trail of victims and authorities began connecting him to Leichner and Nader's disappearances. While he was never charged in their case, investigators remained convinced of his involvement. A witness and a jailhouse confession further supported their belief. But, just to put this out there, Schaefer was notorious for admitting to things that he definitely did not do. Leichner, a graduate of Largo High School, and Nader, both Pinellas County, Florida residents, had only crossed paths once before their ill-fated picnic. Their cases, shrouded in mystery, remain unsolved to this day. In 2007, authorities made a disheartening announcement declaring the closure of the Leichner and Nader cases. They attributed the disappearances to the chilling actions of John Schaefer, who had been convicted of two murders and was suspected in the deaths of countless others. Schaefer did meet his demise in prison in 1995, preventing justice from being served in these particular cases. The families of the loved ones of Leichner and Nader continue to grapple with the haunting uncertainty surrounding their fate. Their stories serve as a chilling reminder of the dark depths humanity can reach. As time marches on, the quest for answers persists, fueled by the hope that the truth behind their mysterious disappearance will finally come to light one day. The Disappearance of Roger Sawyer one month after the mysterious disappearance of Roger Sawyer during a camping trip in Everglades National Park, his family remains hopeful that he will be found safe. However, as they return to their homes on the West Coast without any clues about his whereabouts, they are left with the lingering questions about the lack of media involvement in the search efforts. Roger Sawyer, a 67-year-old retired Oregon butcher, was an experienced outdoorsman, he vanished without a trace on March 5th while camping with his family in the Flamingo Campground area at Everglades National Park. The camping trip culminated in a cross-country journey in their motorhome. Sawyer's daughter-in-law, Janice Williams, shared details of their journey recounting their adventures exploring the Florida Keys. According to Williams, while some family members visited the visitor center, Sawyer and his wife Paula remained at the campground. As darkness fell and people started to return to the motorhome, Sawyer was notably absent. Concerned, the family alerted park officials and a search was immediately launched with the assistance of Miami-Dade Fire Rescue. Despite extensive search efforts, which included scouring the water, beach, and every possible location, no trace of Sawyer was found. Williams expressed the family's confusion and frustration over the lack of progress in finding him. No shoes, no hat, or personal belonging was discovered, leaving them puzzled about how a man in good health, with no signs of dementia, and a background in outdoor survival, could vanish without a trace within a national park. Now, you listening to the Swamp Dweller channel know that that is definitely not out of the norm here. 
The initial response from the National Park Service and Miami-Dade Fire Rescue included sharing essential information with the media. However, as the search continued, the flow of information dwindled. It was initially reported that the family did not want to speak to reporters or provide a photo of Sawyer for some reason. Still, the family does deny this claim, later confirmed by a park spokesperson. In an interview with CBS Miami, Williams revealed the decision to withhold a photo of Sawyer from the media was made by the incident team managing the search, as they wanted to prioritize dedicating manpower to search efforts. Williams clarified that the family was willing to cooperate with the media and believed their involvement could have aided in locating Sawyer. She expressed disappointment that the media attention they had hoped for did not materialize. The search, managed solely by a dedicated incident team from the U.S. Park Service, continued for approximately 10 days but yielded no results. Eventually, the family had no choice but to return home, still without any answers about what happened to Sawyer. Williams expressed gratitude for the efforts of the Park Service and other agencies involved in the search, acknowledging their exhaustive coverage of every inch of the park. However, as Sawyer remains missing, the family began to entertain the unsettling possibility that he might have been taken out of the park. This idea, not previously considered by the searchers, raised questions about the potential benefit of making a photograph of Sawyer public. Such visibility aided search efforts if he had ended up closer to civilization. Nevertheless, the search coordinators made no official request for immediate assistance. Linda Fryer, the public information officer for Everglades National Park, acknowledged that the way information was disseminated during the search is now being reviewed by the Park Service. The family is left clinging to hope considering offering a reward for any information that could lead to resolving Sawyer's mysterious disappearance will help. Paula Sawyer Rawls, Sawyer's daughter, who traveled to South Florida to assist in the search, had since returned home, sharing her anguish on CBSMiami.com, saying, Every passing day intensifies her longing for her father and her desperate wish to have conversations with him again. The void left by his disappearance creates a deep emotional wound that can only begin to heal once they have closure and know what happened to him. As Sawyer's whereabouts remain unknown, friends and strangers across the nation continue expressing their support, well wishes, and encouragement. The family remains hopeful that their search will eventually yield answers ending the agonizing uncertainty they face. As always, I'll be taking you through a light-hearted journey on a not very light topic, but first I do want to begin on a very serious note that's close to my heart, and hopefully yours as well. Most of you have probably seen the Netflix documentary series Tiger King. So you may already be aware that our country has a tendency to domesticate, and I use that term very loosely, exotic animals such as tigers and monkeys. This is a huge problem unto itself, but there's an even bigger problem behind it. Yes, many of these animals are the result of breeding, but there are countless more being brought in by poachers and their journey is unspeakably cruel. Sadly, just as many are slaughtered for their hides and horns, but animals aren't the only victims of poaching. Statistics show, on average, two park rangers are killed by poachers each week worldwide, but some experts believe that the number may be much higher. Of course, that's not including other park personnel or civilians. Each year, that totals over 100 human deaths on top of an already heinous crime. Yet, there is so little awareness surrounding the issue. The men and women losing their lives while trying to protect these animals deserve our recognition and gratitude. While yes, we may have a few jokes bordering on inappropriate throughout today's video, please don't lose sight of the real message. Hungry Hungry Komodo Dragon This first story is an exotic one. We're starting off in Rincha Island in Indonesia, Komodo National Park to be exact. According to the Canberra Times, Komodo dragons have lived on the islands of Indonesia, completely isolated from predators for about a million years. At the time of this article in 2021, there were an estimated 5,000 dragons living in the park. They most commonly eat deer, buffalo, goats, and birds, 
Sometimes they'll eat their prey whole, while other times they'll poison it with a venomous bite and stalk their dinner until it dies, even if that takes three weeks' time. In 2009, a ranger named Mian arrived at his office located inside a small wooden building in the main camp. Nothing seemed out of ordinary until he sat at his desk and happened to look down to see a Komodo dragon next to his leg. Mian would later learn a cleaner had left the door open, allowing the Komodo to enter in search of food. Now it seemed to find some. To make matters even more terrifying, the ranger was only wearing sandals. His feet were his only weapon and they were completely unprotected. He knew if he didn't get his leg away, the dragon would bite it and swallow. Very carefully, he tried to pull his leg back, but the dragon followed. And Mian knew he was in trouble when its tail moved to strike from the other side. He pulled his leg back too fast and became trapped beneath the desk. That's when the Komodo clamped down and refused to let go. Its teeth were ripping into Mian's flesh. Thinking fast, he managed to pin the beast down slightly by putting his free foot onto its neck. Using his free hand, he was miraculously able to pull the animal's mouth open, thereby freeing his leg, but his hand was now also bitten during the struggle. All the while, Mian was shouting for help and other rangers rushed to his aid, but to their horror, more Komodo dragons were also close behind. Lured by the smell of blood, some rangers tried to keep the new arrivals under control while two others hurried to assist Mian with the Komodo inside. These creatures can seem docile most of the time, but they're actually merely conserving energy. They're actually quite fast when attacking. In normal situations, park staff would simply use a stick to push the dragon aside or flee. Any further engagement would simply be unthinkable. Mian estimated there were seven additional dragons waiting when he finally emerged from the building. One friend pushed them away with a stick while another helped him awaiting transportation. After a short boat ride, Mian was taken to a hospital on Flores Island before being flown to Bali where he received six hours of emergency medical treatment. He was required to stay in Bali for an additional week before returning to Flores Island for six months of recovery. Eventually, he also resumed his job at the Komodo National Park, though he only does desk duty an understandable choice if not a slightly ironic decision. You know, considering how it actually happened. The dragon that bit him was still living as of July 2021, and though Mian was unable to tell it apart from the others, he does believe its smaller size was the only reason he's still alive today. Though he suffers from terrible nightmares and doesn't enjoy reliving the incident, he hopes that sharing his story will help spread awareness to the dangers of Komodo dragons. Bull Elk Bulldozer Next up we have one of our favorite locations, Yellowstone National Park, where the Bull Elk use cars for fighting practice. Usually, when we hear of an animal attack in a national park, we can't help but to wonder what role the victim played. Did they get within selfie range of a moose? Did they try to hand feed a bear? You never know what you're going to get, but sometimes wild animals are just going to be wild animals. On this occasion, a bull elk made its way into a Yellowstone National Park parking lot, and, well, here's what an eyewitness said in a Whiskey Riff interview. This happened on September 10th, 2021, when my family and I took a vacation to Yellowstone National Park. We were on our way back to the Airbnb when we saw a lot of park rangers trying to keep people at a certain distance. So I drove back around and parked right in front of the elk. It is during the rutting season, so the males were hyper-aggressive. He lunged at two cars before ramming into the ranger's vehicle. In the video, the elk is clearly unimpressed as it scans its surroundings, and one car can be seen backing away before it's far too late. But then the animal launches itself toward in a full charge, colliding directly into the side of a park ranger's vehicle. Rutting season is no joke, and this was at its peak. Typically, the season lasts from September to October, but sometimes it can begin as early as August. Battling over mates is a common occurrence among North American bull elk, and sometimes they're even fatal. In this overly aggressive state, anything can be seen as a challenger, be it animal, human, or even a car. Honestly, we're lucky it was only a vehicle and not a person. It could easily have gone the other way. Just let this be a lesson to you. If you plan to visit Yellowstone, try to make sure it's not during rutting season. Grizzly Mama Next up, we have a good old-fashioned bear attack. 
And no, when animals attack, video is complete without at least one, right? Seriously, it's the law. There's no lack of potential encounters, either. In fact, you may very well be seeing a dedicated bear attack episode in the future, but for now, I want to tell you about Canadian Park Ranger Jordan Carberry. In July 2018, Jordan was 50 years old, living in Bella Coola, British Columbia, when he found himself in a fight for his life. He was outside of his home early on a Tuesday morning when he noticed a couple of bear cubs sitting in a cherry tree and their mother, who was nearby. He had just taken a picture of the mother when a branch snapped, one of the cubs came crashing to the ground, the fall triggered the overprotective mother, and she charged directly at Carberry. A bear will usually display certain signs before going on the attack, but there was no lip smacking or loud huffs to give warning in this case. Also, since grizzly bears can run up to an astonishing 35 miles per hour, Jordan believed he was done for. The New York Post quotes the ranger as saying, She had her eyes locked on me, and she was coming for me. I instantly turned and tried to get back into the house. All of a sudden, I just got tackled from behind and was sent flying. It felt like two football players tackling me at the same time. The grizzly bear was suddenly on top of Jordan, wrapping her jaws around his head and lifting him with her mouth. That's when part of his ear and part of his scalp tore free and he fell to the ground. But Mama Bear wasn't quite finished. She then lifted him by his thigh and dropped him a few more times for good measure. Carberry loved bears before this incident, and as a park ranger, he had recently taken a defensive training class where he learned what to do during such an occasion. He estimates landing at least three kicks to the bear's face before finally regaining his feet and taking a few swings. He was aiming for her snout, but he missed each attempt. Jordan later stated, She was like a prize boxer. She was so fast. Though, he wasn't able to land a punch, he did gain enough distance from the bear to run the 40 feet back to his house. Don't forget this guy had been lifted by his thigh and dropped multiple times. That's the power of adrenaline for you. Some sources state he didn't have cell reception, while others state he lost his phone in the scuffle itself. But regardless of why he couldn't call for help, Carberry was forced to drive himself on a 10 minute trip to the hospital. After grabbing his keys, he had to make it to his vehicle while the bear was still just outside. When he made a run for it, the grizzly did charge at him again, but thankfully she didn't commit. During the drive, Jordan continuously repeated, Don't pass out. Don't pass out. You guys remember the part about a scalp tearing, right? This wasn't even his main concern. He caught a glimpse of his body form in the mirror, and in his own words, I was mostly concerned with my abdomen because I thought she had split me open. I thought my guts were hanging out. Upon arrival, he was transferred to Vancouver General Hospital where he underwent surgery for umbilical hernias. That's when the intestine protrudes through the muscle at the belly button. His other injuries included a severed ear, a torn scalp, and several puncture wounds from the bear's canines. You can actually view pictures on American Shooting Journal, but YouTube will get upset if I include them here. So you can find a link down in the description if you are interested. By all accounts, he seems to have handled the entire trauma like a champ, though. After a two-week recovery in the hospital, where he constantly kept the doctors and nurses laughing, he was finally able to return home. He felt incredibly lucky to be alive and made lighthearted jokes on Facebook such as, Good thing I have such a thick skull. A CBC article mentions volunteers picked the fruit from Carberry's trees to make it safer. While there, they collected a video revealing up to eight bears were frequenting the ranger's yard. The Conservation Office Service decided to not euthanize the bear because she was merely protecting her cubs and hasn't posed any other public safety threats. This was a decision Carberry wholeheartedly agreed with, stating, It was me dropping my guard in grizzly country, which you can never do. I did it because I was so close to my house, and I learned a big lesson. Chimps Gone Wild our number four slot takes us to the Jane Goodall Institute Chimpanzee Eden in South Africa. In June of 2012, Ranger Andrew Oberle, 26 years old, was leading a tour when two chimpanzees suddenly grabbed his feet and pulled him beneath a fence. Andrew was savagely mauled and dragged for nearly a kilometer into their enclosure. The sanctuary's director, Eugene Cousins, fired a shot into the air, scaring the animals back into their enclosure. Chimp Eden effectively went into lockdown while investigation took place to determine if the animals would be destroyed. The sanctuary's official statement read, 
Chimpanzees are wild animals and are defensive of their territories. Any interaction between humans and wild animals can be dangerous. The chimpanzees at Chimp Eden have suffered horrible injuries and abuse from humans and therefore have been treated with caution. After undergoing surgery, Andrew remained in critical condition at Nail Spruit Hospital, where he was treated for the lost part of an ear, parts of his fingers, and at the time of his attack, he was studying for his master's degree in anthropology and primatology at the University of Texas in San Antonio. The executive director of the institute, David Devos Usthusian, spoke with the Toronto Star to confirm Andrew's injuries were quite extensive and that this was the first incident of its kind since the park's opening in 2006. Killer Elephant As always, I've saved the wildest story for last. In a Thailand e In an eastern province in Thailand, last September, two men were killed over a three-day period by a rogue elephant. I just want to add a quick disclaimer that I'm probably going to accidentally pronounce the names and villages wrong. I know it, you know it, let's not make a thing of it, okay? For around five months, an elephant from the Top Lawn National Park was raiding villages and farms for food in Tambon Kang Sidu. According to the Bangkok Post, it was happening almost daily and, as one would imagine, the damage was massive and widespread. Finally, after two people were seriously injured, a park ranger by the name of Arts Hit Fieng Wham led volunteers into an attempt to drive the elephant away. On a Sunday, September 11th, 2022, the village chief, Saraya Uterapas, the park ranger, and other volunteers rushed to confront the elephant. The ranger attempted to scare the beast away with firecrackers, but it retaliated, and the ranger was unable to move away in time. As a result, he was stomped into the ground until his body was basically half buried, gravely wounded, as he rushed to Nadi Hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Also, I do want to note that while the Bangkok Post refers to this incident as a single elephant, other articles do state that it was a herd of elephants. Of course, it's always possible we're losing something in translation, but just a quick FYI before we move on to the second incident. Just two days later, on the 13th, a group of rangers from Klong Kura Wai Wildlife Sanctuary were trying to clear out six elephants at the Longan Plantation in eastern Shanthaburi, and 42-year-old park ranger Somfob Shri Nam was among the group. The reports state that the ranger didn't realize one of the elephants stood only a mere 30 meters away. When the animal noticed him, he was taken off guard and unable to escape. His body was later transferred to Pong Namron District Hospital to undergo an autopsy. I don't understand why an autopsy was necessary, but Thai PBS World seems confident that that's how it's happened. Shortly after these incidents, Fadet Lai Thong, director of the Wildlife Conservation Office, felt the park rangers were in desperate need of modern equipment and was able to procure 30 night vision binoculars to kickstart the process. He also wished to stress that only some elephants pose a threat to humans, the majority are not aggressive. Drinking and Driving in the Bayou by Crystal the Boss I live in coastal South Mississippi, not far from the Louisiana line. Everyone around here knows everyone in their families, so it's hard to duck and dodge people if someone wants to. But one place we can always run and hide from people is Bayou La Croix, and a road that runs through the swamp and marsh. It used to be a reservation for Native Americans. This story occurred in my later teen years or young adult years, when we would tear up that old dirt road with our trucks and ATVs. Unfortunately, many accidents happen on that old dirt road as well. One night, while drinking with some friends, the girl I was hanging out with at the time was trying to impress a boy, and he had a friend. So I was the improvised wingman, and we drank straight from the bottle. One of the boys said, Let's go mud riding. Me being the tomboy that I am voted for going. So did everyone else. And being arrogant, confident young adults, we ignored the obvious signs that the road was dangerous, especially while driving and drinking. I'd always heard that there was something dark about that road, 
The Native American burial grounds and cemeteries surrounding didn't make it any less creepy either. I've always heard around town that there was a territorial presence there, and that should be avoided. We never really believed it, though. We all piled into the Ford Bronco and went on our way. As soon as we pulled onto the road, I immediately felt anxious and uneasy and regretted my decision. The truck was sliding, mud was flying, and we were having a great time at first. Until we did a few donuts and came to a complete stop. The guy driving slammed on the gas pedal, and we hit a pine tree head on. I smashed into the driver's seat, and everything went black. I woke up to screaming and crying from my friend and groans from the boys, one yelling, We gotta get out of here! There was blood everywhere. One of the boys and my friend were absolutely just smashed. My head was pounding, the pain in my legs were throbbing, there was an unfamiliar stench in the air. I looked up and noticed a pair of eyes locked on us in the darkness. The reality of what was setting in, my pain immediately subsided. I said to them, We, we have to run! The guy that wasn't driving had seen the eyes too, and he snatched my friend out of the truck and we all ran. The possible rattlesnakes, water moccasins, and everything else that could bite us were out of our minds when we heard the snarling and growling that was following us. Thankfully, we made it to the interstate where a random person drove us all to the hospital. Somehow, I made it through an accident without an entire scratch, just a little bit of a bruise on my head. My friend broke her nose, one of the boys had hit the steering wheel so hard that he bit through his own lip, and a lot of the other kids had like shattered elbows and bones. However, I have terrible knees from slamming into the driver's seat, and I still experience side effects to this day. I don't know what lurks down that road. From what I've experienced, I believe it's what the locals call the Rougarou. A swamp werewolf, if you will. I don't understand why I came out of that accident flawless. Well, almost flawless. I should have gone through the windshield because I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. When we hit that tree, we hit so hard the engine block almost became the dash. It's something that's been bothering me lately, because I drive at night close to that road all the time. It's been over 10 years, and a jail has been built in that area, but I still watch the tree line for those eyes. There's a shadow above my bed. By Dubiously Yours. I haven't been sleeping well lately. At first, I thought it was because my toddler has been insisting on sleeping in my bed, relegating her poor father to living room sofa most of the time. She's a fitful sleeper, and oftentimes I end up with a little foot kicking me in the side or a softly snoring face pressed into my neck. I don't mind that, though, which is why I'm starting to think the reason for my lack of sleep isn't her, but rather this odd feeling, or thing that I think I see above me in the dark. The room, it isn't completely void of light at night. My computer has a few small lights that pulse off and on even when it's powered down, and it's in this dim, off and on glow that I see it. Up there, where the wall meets the ceiling, there's a shadow that vaguely looks, well, like the shape of a body, as if someone is laying prone in the angle of the ceiling somehow resting up there despite gravity. Part of the shadow curves out in a way that I swear looks like a person lifting their head while laying flat. I tried to show my husband, but he doesn't see it. He thinks something in the room must be casting a shadow. But I can't, for the life of me, figure out what could make that shape. I get this unsettling feeling in my stomach the longer I look at it. It's almost like, the longer I look, the more this figure becomes clear the more I almost see a face. I can't look at it anymore. I feel like it's almost feeding off of my attention, like somehow me acknowledging that it's there makes it even more real. This seems more and more true, because if I force myself to look away for some time, when I look back at it, it's suddenly much, much more vague. It's back to being just a shadow. But it's been days, and it's still there. Well, not so much there as it almost seems like it's not on the ceiling anymore. It's on the wall. It's closer. I never see it move, but I swear it's closer. I'm so scared to go to sleep 
I'm laying here, staring up at my, at my wall with my daughter's sleeping form at my side, and I think I see its face again. I think it has arms now, and I think I see hands. If I close my eyes, will it fade away, or will I force myself to open them and look at them again? Will that face be inches from my own? I can't go to sleep, and I swear, I think I heard it move. Welcome back, friends. I see my last set of tales on the missing 411 in Rainbow Springs National Park got some traction. It's good to know that when I'm gone, the tales of what these poor souls endured lives on. Kind of lets me feel like I'm leaving some sort of legacy behind, you know? Well, I have a few more, especially since things are ramping up on my end, but we'll get to that in due time. For now, I'll tell you about three more incidents on my journey across this beautiful vista we call America. This time, we're stopping over in the state hosting the oldest park in the nation, Georgia. Indian Springs State Park was established back in 1825 and is located just by the I-75. It is a 528-acre display of beauty with multiple springs that the natives used to heal their wounds. Hence the name. It is also the site of some of the more unusual and genuinely unsettling cases I've worked with, proving one thing to me beyond all else. Sometimes, even in the kind of job where you follow people, or your work follows you, I should say, you never know what's just beyond the corner. Case 1. Born from the Earth. Taken by the Earth. It was a hot July afternoon. I was trying to catch a siesta in my car with the AC on full and soothing death metal albums on full blast when I got a text from my assistant. How far are you from Yehola Creek? Bleary eyed and sweating, I looked at my GPS. About 15 minutes. Why? Clients want to see you. Says it's urgent. Be there in 20 minutes. They're expecting you. I began to type back that I needed more notice than that when those infamous three bubbles showed up that she was still texting. Her response was four words that had me rushing into action. It's a park ranger. Fifteen minutes and a cool soda later, I was sat in Yehola Creek Diner across from a slender woman in her late thirties, red hair tied back into a neat bun and freckles shining in the spotlight. Her expression was grim, but that did not stop me from acting like a damn schoolboy around her stumbling over my words. I was never good with attractive, powerful women. Nice to meet you. I'm Martha. You're Wilson, right? Saw the incident over in Florida with the missing family. Heard the rangers there gave you a hard time. Her smile doesn't meet her eyes, but it's disarming enough that I feel the need to qualify the statement. Maybe even boast a little bit. I undo my tie ever so slightly and smile hoping I'm not sweating more than I think. Yeah, there was a bit more going on than what they said publicly, but you'd probably not believe me. I hesitated. Her expression didn't change as I carried on. I saw sort of a elephant grave, missing people who shouldn't be there, all of them talking about the Baron. She finished my sentence for me and didn't break her gaze. Rangers talk, we know. Can't say they wanted to keep it quiet. But that doesn't mean we don't hear about it, especially when that same Baron has been operating in our park. She slides a photo towards the desk. The sun glints off the top of the corner and adds sort of a mystique to the otherwise grim image. It's a Polaroid of a heavy, pregnant, disheveled woman looking barefoot into the deeper part of the forest. Her skin is covered in dirt, scratches, and bruises. Her t-shirt is ripped and her pants look two sizes too small but there is a determination in her face I had seen far too many times. She's going somewhere, and she has a goal in mind. I breathed, looking at the photo closer. Who is she? Angela Daniels, 27, and from Bexar, Texas. She fled up here after certain laws were enacted in that state thanks to Mr. Abbott. Martha's teeth gritted and her brow furrowed. This was personal to her. She came here at the request of something. Look, I don't want to politicize the... I started, my words catching in my throat the moment I said them, knowing full well I was being stupid. Martha's eyes burned. You got kids, Wilson? 
she growled. N no ma'am, I, I don't, not too fond of them myself. And it was that simple for you, huh? Just to decide, nope, and walk away, right? I, uh, yeah. I felt hot under my collar as she grilled me. She picked up the photo and shoved it towards me. This is what happens when you do not get a choice in the matter to walk away. When you're denied the same fairness as a man to get your rocks off and make mistakes. Why? Because some creature in the sky says so? No, because men say so. She simmers down and recomposes herself. Ain't no politicizing the issue. It's a person's life and the right to choose. Simple as that. Things went silent for a while. I don't know why I took a cowardly stance on something like that. Never liked to ruffle feathers, I guess. Look, I'm sorry. I wasn't being considerate. Sometimes in my job you try to separate things and be objective, but... I rub my neck, not trying to meet her gaze. Yeah, that's my bad. I'm sorry. I held out my hand, and she took it, her gaze softening just a little bit. No, you're alright. I should be professional too. It's just, this one hurts. Especially when most of my career either has colleagues grabbing my ass, calling it horseplay, or tourists not taking me seriously when I advise them that there's legitimate danger if they don't look out. It gets exhausting. I shouldn't have jumped down your throat like that. She sighs and looks at the photo. We don't know how she got to the park, but she carved a message into a tree near the entrance. Like, she wanted people to see it. What was it? I asked, but I already knew the answer. The Baron provides. She said simply, a quiver in her lips like she knew the danger it brought by simply uttering it. I wanted to bring you in because of prior experience. I'm hoping you can find her and why she traveled to this part of the world. What she seeks there. It grew silent. My cold drink lay empty and I was already desperate for another. She looked like she hadn't eaten or slept in days. So, I indulged her. Hey. Let's get another cold one, and you can give me some details, okay? She didn't protest as another round came to the table, the drinks clinking softly as we settled in and trying to diffuse the last of the tension. In my experience, people come to places for some specific attraction or oddity. Can you think of any that might have brought her here? She thought for a moment before pulling out a map and pointing a few acres into the woods at a small blotch of open area where a tree stood. Here, our oldest oak tree is a nice rest spot for trail walkers. Some say at night you can hear the spirits of the dead. Maybe she went to commune with them. Maybe, but why didn't any of you try to stop her? One heavily pregnant woman on the trail at night ain't exactly, you know, the smartest thing. Furthermore, why call me in if you know where she's going? I couldn't help but ask knowing that any other sane person would do the same given the information. She sighed and rubbed her temple. Because despite what we know, none of us on rotation right now have dealt with the more unusual aspects of the job. We wanted someone who had. That's it. That's it. I stared a little dumbfounded at the response. You brought me in because I had a run-in with something odd and you know of the Baron. Well, <laughs> shoot. Get the damn Ghostbusters then. You know where she is, and that she's not a threat. I'm a P.I., not a bounty hunter, Martha. I got up, ready to leave, grabbing my hat as I headed to the door. Six campers have gone missing near that tree in the last two years. Most recent was a fortnight ago. We need to tell the family something. She blurted out. She couldn't see my grin, but I was elated. Now, I had something. After a bit more conversing, it was determined that she'd lead me into the clearing and then leave me for a couple of hours before returning to collect me at sundown. She wanted to stay, but I explained the job got boring after a while, and that I worked better alone. I'm sure I'd have enjoyed her company just fine, but after our awkward exchange earlier, I didn't want to piss her off any further. Beyond that, I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was off, and I didn't want to have too many foxes in the henhouse. If you'll pardon the phrasing, something in my gut stirred. I felt unease and tried to ignore it as I smiled and thanked her, trying to ignore the overwhelming thought in my mind. This feels too routine. A thought struck me as I recounted the rumors in my brain, my head bouncing off an errant branch, punishment for not looking where I was going. Pride was wounded but relatively unscathed. 
She helped me to my feet as we crossed the clearing. I pushed the concern to the side for the moment and did my job looking around. The clearing was about 100 feet in diameter, simple dirt occupying the space save for the gargantuan oak tree in the far corner, thick roots jutting out from the base and trailing over to a small patch of land in front of it, like it was claiming territory. Anyone been out here since Angela was spotted? I called as I inspected the surrounding area. No. The experienced boys said it was barren territory and they'd think of something, but they didn't say shit and so it was left to me to clean the mess up. I can't look another goddamn family in the eyes and tell them, we lost another one. Martha's voice quivered. This was personal. That thought rose back up once more, but I tried to move past it. We'll find her. Don't worry. You called me here for a reason, right? You can stay if you really want to, I guess. I teased, hoping to lighten the mood just a tad, but walking back over to her, I was surprised by how terrified she seemed. You know what? I don't want to go any further anyway. Martha breathed with her fist balled. Being here just gives me the willies. Do what you gotta do and I'll circle back before sundown. If you have any issues, use this. She hands me a flare gun and stares me dead in the face. Usually for bears, but, well, we don't know what's around here. Good luck, Wilson. With that, she left the way she came and I stood there, processing the information I had and dreading what I had to do next. Inspect the base of the roots. It looked as if while the clearing had seen some activity and old footprints belonging to various campers remained, the ten-foot radius surrounding the tree was rather untouched. Eerily so. Venturing closer, I began to notice the branches swaying almost rhythmically and my eyes almost felt bewitched by them. Before I knew it, I'd stumbled over an errant branch and fell face first into the dirt, just a foot away from an opening at the base of the tree. I could see down into the darkness and felt my blood run cold as something began calling out from the depths. It was a crying baby. Eyes flicker for a moment and a sharp pang of fear rushes through me as I instinctively reach through the gap to try and grab at the baby I cannot see. Instead, I feel my arm being clawed at by something as a cackling ripples through my ears. The sensation of being violently pulled gives way to total darkness. I don't know how long I was out for, but when I came to eyes dazed and head throbbing, I caught the distinct scents of iron and sulfur. A sobbing accompanied the wailing of a child, and I craned my damaged neck ever so slightly to locate the source. It was Angela, covered in blood and filthier than she'd been just half a day prior, holding her baby in her arms as it wailed, but not protectively, not against her breast as mothers do. No. She was holding it out to... something. W wait I croaked, hoping to change her mind, to save her. The scene shifted as I made myself known. Angela's head snapped towards me, abject fear in her eyes and a look of disbelief plastered across her face, avoiding looking at her baby. It's... not... a baby. She breathed. Instinctively, I pulled my flare gun out and fired it above me to get a better look at what was going on, to see if there was any immediate threat. Foolhardy, I know. The bundle in her arms thrashed and kicked, crying and wailing distorts until what was in her arms is no longer a baby. Pale, scabby limbs stretched out, eyes bulging from their sockets. When that little light caught the baby's reflection, my stomach turned and I could see and do nothing but watch at the succeeding events. She was right. It wasn't a baby. It was a parasite. As Angela's bloody hands held the creatures up, a distinctive mantra permeated the cavern and rang in my ears, with a new verse added. The Baron provides, born from the earth, taken by the earth, the Baron provides. It happened so fast. Something emerged from the darkness at the base of the roots and reached out with arms coated in tar, bubbling and steaming on the ground where it fell off the trunk like a pendant burning into the soil. The ear-splitting wails were quickly drowned out by the tar filling the parasite's mouth and coating it in that same viscous substance. Angela simply stood with eyes wide open before slumping to the ground as the body was taken from her. The looming figure of the Baron gazing at me as my vision too began to blur and I hit the ground hard as a voice sent me into silence. 
A new duke from the thrall. The family grows. When I awoke, Ranger Martha was tending to me at the nearby station. A few colleagues gathered around a work desk in the next room with frustrated looks on their faces and a grim air hanging around them. The taller one shook his head as the portlier one sighed, radioing in something imperceptible and taking a few documents away to be shredded. Hey Wilson, you back with us? Martha smiled, but it didn't reach her eyes. She knew the moment mine met hers that I'd seen him, the Baron. What did he do? What happened? Why, why don't you ask about Angela? I croaked, my mouth feeling like I had soil and sand compacted into it. Martha sighed and handed me a glass of water as she shook her head. I would, if Angela was here, but it's just you. We found you face down with your head caught in the roots of the tree. Almost like you'd been trapped there. You're gonna have some burns around your neck and a weak voice for a while. She snuck a glance toward the station where one of her colleagues was sat watching a DVD copy of Shrek 2, laughing and not even trying to hide his lack of responsibility. They don't believe me. Us. They think you ate some bad mushrooms and tripped your ass off. They said Angela likely fell and got taken away by some nature or a beast. But I was the first one who got to you, Wilson. I know you saw something. I paused, making sure nobody else was in earshot. He took the baby. Well, not a baby, I guess. It said it was adding it to his family, like a duke. Angela went white and passed out. I did soon after. That's... that's it. I took a breath, steadied myself. I, I guess Angela had something else growing inside of her after all. Hopefully she got away safely. Something inside Martha bristled, and that same smile that didn't reach her eyes returned, but with a twitch behind it. I knew that look all too well. But you said she wasn't... she wasn't there. I began, Martha's smile fading as she realized I caught on. I did. She's not in this world with us, Wilson. We, we found her gutted and disemboweled half a mile from your location. Her eyes and mouth filled with soil. A blood trail led from her body to a cave a ways out from any known campsites. Like I said, rangers think it was a beast that took her and her baby, but... Her eyes widened. I guess he's getting bolder. We sat in silence for a while as I recuperated before I felt well enough to check into a doctor's and say I had a bad fall. As I grabbed my jacket and put my earphones in, hitting shuffle on my iPod as Ain't No Grave by Johnny Cash came on, Martha hit me with a poignant question to close out an otherwise mentally scarring day. It looks like the Baron has plans for you, Wilson. I don't want to see you hurt. What will you do now? Simple. I'll go find the rest of his family, one tree branch at a time. Case 2 Before we move on with the main threat of the Baron, I think it's important to let you guys know that not all weird jobs involve the parks. In fact, one of the weirdest in my career came from the middle of a suburban area in an unassuming house with a relatively boring start to the case. My wife is going into this weird bar and refuses to talk or do anything for days on end when she gets back. She then acts like she never went to the bar only to do it again on specific nights. I'm at my wits end with this. What can you do? The man sat across from me as exhausted tears in his eyes with his legs shaking, a wreck of a husband. This was clearly his last straw. And you're sure she's not cheating? I responded blankly. This was the usual answer to a lot of my jobs, and while the poor guy was struggling, I had to ask and gauge his response. No, no, I swear to God. I'm not an idiot. I'd look for signs and changes in her behavior like that. But when she forgets she went, she's back to the sweet, loving woman I married ten years ago. I even followed her to this bar once, but... He trails off. Looking at his feet, the cat clock in my office ticks incessantly as the eyes skirt from left to right. Outside, a storm is brewing. But... I usher him to continue. I think it's better you see for yourself. You won't believe me. Please, I'll pay your full fee up front, and if you find nothing after the first few observations, I'll trust my wife. Hale hit the windows as he finished his plea. I took it as a sign. Alright, let's go over the details. 
The man's name was Victor Mendoza and his wife was Lily. Both were 34 years in age, in good health, and had a strong marriage until Lily had a near-death experience when she was 32. She got into a car wreck and afterwards claimed she saw something while she was being revived. She'd technically been dead for six minutes and would routinely be withdrawn and reserved following her recovery. It was around a year ago that she began visiting this bar and those same withdrawn behaviors became more pronounced, leading us to present day. I asked for a direction to this place and Victor told me it was located in a suburban area under the name The Empty Throne. The first night was just strict observation, watching from afar once the husband confirmed she left their home in a trance and hadn't stated where she was going, taking his car near midnight. I took up residence in my car by someone's driveway. I paid them in the form of a couple of pizzas and assured them I'd cause no trouble. Then I waited. The bar was supposed to be nestled between a sandwich shop called Choose Your Ciabatta and a disused carpet store, but from my vantage point there was nothing there save for the tiniest of alleyways, not fit for a person to sittle through comfortably, but it was doable. Sure enough, Our Lady of the Hour rolled up and mechanically walked towards the street. For a moment, I was certain the bar was inside the disused carpet store, but Lily stretched and moved her arms rhythmically before twisting them behind her in order to fit down the alleyway. I can't say she was in pain, but I damn sure couldn't do that with my bulky frame and T-Rex arms, that's for sure. Once I knew she was out of sight, I took a quick beat around the area to get a good understanding of the layout. It seemed there may be a way down through the connecting carpet store. I certainly wouldn't make it any other way. I waited until the sun was nearly peeking over the horizon and spied Lily, now disheveled and out of breath, forcing herself through the narrow crevice with none of the grace she had shown before. She was wide-eyed, frantic, and threw up all over the pavement before quickly wiping her mouth and vaulting over the hood of her car to get in and drive off in a panic. In this moment, I was assuming it was some sort of sordid drug den or something equally shady you go when you're adamant to cover up something from the rest of the world. I called Victor to tell him as such. Did you go inside? Did you see the bar? He pressed, unconvinced in my theory. No, but I... Mr. Wilson, you need to get into that bar. You won't understand why I'm worried until you do. H have you seen it, Victor? A long pause, shuddering in his voice as he took a deep breath. <sighs> Once Lily and I had a fight about her trips and she was adamant she didn't do it. Stormed off saying she needed to think. I drank myself to sleep when I woke up. I was in the car being driven somewhere by Lily. I don't know if I drank too much or she did something to the wine, but I, was, I wasn't able to move. She helped me towards the bar and... and... He trailed off, as if stifling a sob. You need to get in there, Mr. Wilson. I'm worried that they're doing something to her. If what I saw was true, you need to help her. That was enough to pique my interest, so I soldiered on and created a plan for the next excursion Lily would take. It turned out to be three weeks later. Victor said he could tell it was going to happen, and I made my preparations. I got there around dusk after asking around, managed to procure the keys to the old carpet store. Damn place stank of mold, mothballs, and sweat, but it was sprawling and most definitely had windows that connected past the narrow alley. It was a large bay window that seemed to view out on a vacant lot. Nothing remarkable at all in the enclosed space, just unforgiving concrete in every direction and a single faded yellow door atop a large stoop. Bingo. This time, I sat in the store and waited for the telltale signs of Lily making her way through the alleyway. After a few tentative minutes, she scurried through and practically fell to her knees in the lot, the clear moonlight casting a looming shadow around the building. Her limbs shook as the skin scraped against the concrete. She stayed there for a couple of minutes, muttering something under her breath that continued as she walked towards the stew. A rhythmic knock on the metallic yellow door followed by the distinct sound of nails scratching against the frame eventually allowed the door to yield and let her in, an imperceptible darkness shrouding everything after that moment. I waited for quite some time before trying my luck, 
doing the usual, if I'm not in touch within 30 minutes, this is where I am, to my assistant, when I felt uncertain about my situation. Then, imitating Lily's knock, two things overcame me as I stood in front of the door. A strong sense of foreboding, not dissimilar to that of a bear watching you in the woods without you immediately catching on, and the volume of heat coming from the other side of the door. It was like someone had an oven pressed against the other side. Sure enough, however, the door swung open with no apparent bouncer, and I was permitted entrance within the humid property. Pitch black, the smell of ginseng and herbs overwhelmed my nostrils as a pair of hands steered me forward, talking enthusiastically the entire time. You come to us broken, destitute, directionless. We smell the trepidation on you. We wish to correct it. We will correct it. Simply clear your mind, breathe deep the scent of the Great One, and sit in front of the empty throne. I couldn't move. The hand steered me aggressively further in, eyes watering from the overwhelming pungent scent of earth rot and eucalyptus, things swirling in the darkness as I strained to make out noises that may have tipped me to where Lily was. It would turn out I didn't need to worry. I was being led right to her. The hand shoved me into a large, circular room with every single person twisted into various positions around a large obsidian throne in the center. I didn't even get the time to see much before I felt my body pulled towards a vacant spot in front, legs splitting apart to a degree my unhealthy ass hadn't experienced since I was much younger, arms splayed out to support my weight, and head turned back. I felt my body burn with a searing heat as my eyes remained the only thing I had control over, casting them over the room until I saw Lily. That poor woman was contorted. There was no way her bones weren't broken as she was writhing in indecipherable pain. In front of the throne, the whites of her eyes glistened as she mouthed something unintelligible. Some of those around her weren't even moving a great deal, just minor twitches, death rattles. A low hum permeated around the room and my gaze was eventually drawn back to the throne as my ears filled with a slow, powerful and aggressive chant. The king, the king, the king fills the empty throne. The lights dimmed further and I found even my own voice betraying me, chanting along with them as all of us twisted to get a better look at the throne, desperate to see the king fill the black jagged chair. I remember feeling part of myself slip away, more of this vapid, empty feeling filling me. Was what Lily had felt, real? Did she come here to get away from whatever she saw in those minutes she was dead? I don't know what happened next. I blacked out and when I awoke I was outside the bar in the vacant lot, my body aching all over and a sense of dread encompassing me. I tried calling Victor, but the phone line was disconnected. The money had been deposited into my account, but there was nobody at their address. No Lily either. Best of all, the empty throne building I'd gone to? Nothing. Simply a blank wall with a yellow door and an empty lot. Someone had wanted me to meet the king, but as far as why, I don't know. Case 3 This one isn't as long as the others, but given the pattern forming here, I figured you'd want to hear this. After the incident in our first case, it would take a couple of months recovering and keeping simple jobs like tailing a cheating spouse, watching someone embezzle funds from a dog food company and exposing a right-wing hacker as a sex offender. But eventually, I got the message from my assistant I had been waiting for. An old PI buddy of mine by the name of Dixon got in contact after hearing what I had been through and told me he knew of some people who could help with the, uh, you know, the worst kept secret in the national parks. He said, lay low and avoid any tall trees while he did some digging. But sure enough, he got in touch with a simple text. I've got one. The boy's name was Merson. He had been an impressionable young boy who had gotten in with a bad crowd and, after a prolonged period of gradually spending more and more time with them, eventually cut his parents off and permanently stayed in the forest with them. The group's name? The Mares. Named as such for the horse heads they wore over their faces. Weird freaking people. Let's get that boy home. Hey, Wilson? Dixon chimed. He was gung-ho as ever, but dedicated nonetheless. Kind of a throwback to the old school PIs. 
I like that about him. We agreed to meet at the park itself. Dixon had already been in touch with the staff and they had no desire to dirty their hands in what was being described as a disturbing gathering at the heart of their forest. The family had, of course, spoken to the authorities and under the now expected weird shit goes to the rangers rules, the park rangers handled it. It had gotten so bad that the last time one intervened that the guy was so terrified into submission, beaten terribly, and left the job without disclosing what he had actually seen and what was actually going down with the gathering. He didn't know who was there or what they had done. When a more extensive group ventured out to find them, they got nothing but the remains of the gathering, multiple animal carcasses, blood stains across the trees, and a viscera piled into the center. A simple warning had been left for the remaining rangers that the last employee shakily went as she grabbed her things. The mares take care of the woods now. Your services are no longer required. So knowing our experiences, we were called in. Dixon knew the area much better than I did, so I trailed behind him, taking note of the terrain and keeping an eye out for the supposed border the mares had set up. He's got quite a uh, unique story of his own but we'll have to get there another time. For now, think of him as an eccentric uncle you wish you had instead of your alcoholic riddled one. Little bastards got seen venturing into a local town for supplies. One was bold enough to keep the uh, attire on in public. Naturally, it spooked the locals, but when they tried to approach the three members, they ignored absolutely everyone. They paid with cash and left as quickly as they came. The one guy trailed them, thinking he was slick and out of sight, caught them in the middle of... Uh, Something. Dixon trailed off, lip biting as his push broom mustache bristled. They sent him back, barely conscious as a warning. Nobody will testify out of fear, and it's not yet reached the higher ups. They're hoping we can fix it. D do you think I. Do you think we can? I called, wheezing as I hauled a worn down body up steep inclines and over thick logs. Dixon held up a hand and motioned it forward as we reached the top of our particular hill hunkering down and hiding in a thicket between some trees. Some 200 feet below, down an identical incline we had just climbed, was a circular fire pit, adorned with the trappings of what can only be described as organized chaos. Red ribboned decorations strewn across branches and tied together in complex knots, skulls of various creatures placed atop stumps, attached to clothes and used as utensils. Everywhere you looked was another macabre decoration until you saw the small stone archway leading to a cave that seemed to have been built into the foundations around them. Did they do this? I breathed, scanning for potential information to help and watching the members. The site seemed deserted, and the forest was quiet, save for the natural sounds of the undergrowth. Dixon shook his head, keeping his voice low. No, that's likely an ancient tomb they've repurposed but I've heard what's going on inside of there. He shook his head, turning to me. We have to wait until nightfall. Catch them together, make the call to the rangers. They can swarm in and circle them and take them away if it's their strength and numbers that we need. But it might mean that we take a uh, calculator risk. One rule you'll need to follow. All right, I'm game. You don't do this job as long as I have without some of those. What's the risk? He looked at me. If they bring someone back, no matter how long it takes, you don't intervene. We are two people, and these are freaking nut jobs who have already proven their capabilities and outnumber us significantly. The sooner we radio for help when we know they're gathered, the better. Understand, 80s action hero? We do not intervene. I bit my lip and nodded, knowing he was right to admonish me and that I would go against those suggestions if my instincts took over. We sat at our vantage point and waited for two more hours as the sun set, and with the darkness came an anticipation in the air that was inescapable. It hung around us and made our lungs heavy. Bloodlust. We spotted the torches first, a line over a dozen coming down a small trail, each dancing without sight of its owner in the distance. The soft chanting steadily grew in volume until the group encircled the pit, clacking their ornaments catching my attention and my eyes focusing on their unusual shape. They were bleached bone white, had carvings across the sides, and were held by brown rope. 
It was apparent they were bones before I could even ascertain if they were human. I heard their leader speak up. His hoarse mask matched the bleached whiteness of the bones. The eyes red, and the manned jet black with freckles of gray. Mares, we have another successful feast behind us and an offering in front of us. The Viscount is waiting with eyes open and jaw again. We must provide to him and accept his divine protection from the outsiders. The group clacked in approval. The bones held up like instruments to smash together before the leader held up his arms to silence them. We shall not delay. Under the clear night sky, and with a feast in our bellies, let us grant the offering an audience with the Viscount. Light the ceremonial ornaments. Three members almost tactically ran around setting fire to the hanging decorations, the bright flame confirming what the ranger had said. They were human remains. Intestines rose in flames as small fireballs erupted almost in a rhythmic fashion, illuminating something from the cave. As we watched, I tried to understand if there was a method to the madness, but Dixon figured it out first. They poke holes in the decorations. They're using it like a signal with the thing in the cave. It must be how they know it's safe. Before I could ask further, I saw them drop a small sack onto the ground something writhing inside and screeching like a banshee as the leader stepped forward and unfurled the bag, volleying a kick at its head to quiet it. A child. It was a freaking child. They were no older than ten and had tears in their eyes as they recoiled from the pain. The Baron provides what the Viscount feeds, he hissed, holding his hands up high and chanting with the group, the circle closing in on the poor child as they forced it closer to the cave entrance the light growing brighter as a dull hum emitted from its depths. Dixon, I hissed, feeling the sweat dripping from my brow as he shook his head, not taking his eyes off the scene below. The group is getting closer. Not yet. He shuffled and changed his position, never taking his eyes off them. They're gonna kill the kid. We have to do something. I tried standing up, but a firm grip held me down, Dixon's brow furrowing as his right hand grabbed something. You need to work on your patience, Wilson. He breathed, pulling out a flare gun and firing it above the fire pit, alerting the rangers. Everyone turned and looked up, the bright flare reflecting in their black milky eyes. All but the leader who undeterred threw the child into the cave and called at the top of his lungs. The Viscount feeds. We mass honor the deed. An unholy sound erupted from the cave, guttural, low, rippling off the walls and bursting out of the forest rattling my bones and burning my ears. It was a sound of hunger, insidious intent, and rage wrapped into one. I took Dixon's flare gun without thinking. I had to know what lurked in the cave as I stood up and ran down the hill, brandishing it like a madman as the other mare members had already begun to get out of Dodge. Once I reached the foot of the mountain, Dixon cries, What the hell are you doing? Almost deafening, I fired a single shot toward the cave, towards the leader. He leapt out of the way, as the tunnel was illuminated in a deep crimson for just a mere second. I saw it. I saw its blind, dead eyes, the mouth stretched horizontally so far from the rest of its head, the slow protruding tongue, flat, oblong teeth, the children's tear-straked face as it clawed at the dirt trying to get out from under the single sharp nail. The light must have pissed it off something fierce because the roar changed from a low guttural to a horrifying shriek the child somehow getting free as the ground around us shook. I would not lose someone else, so I took their hand on instinct and made a beeline for the hill, my mind mercifully pushing the image of the Viscount to the back of my mind long enough to survive and think about what was going on. I turned just once on my way back to a skeptical Dixon as a slew of rangers closed in on the fire pit, catching one glimpse of the leader, hands behind his head as he was led to the ground. I swear I saw something leaking, of the fake red eyes on his mask. The mysteries and legend of the Baron continue.